I'm not one for long tutorial intros, so let's get started, shall we? If you want to skip straight to the how to do things part, skip to this time code. I assume you'll be doing that because you know most or all of the background knowledge, or you just want to get started. Now then, this guide will show you the best way to reasonably transfer your VHS tapes. I'll explain why you should be transferring these tapes if you haven't done so, but again, if you want to skip to the part where I tell you what to do, I'll be leaving a time code here. Now, why this tutorial in particular? Well, having scoured the internet, every video VHS tutorial gets at least something wrong. And the only source of information I've found which gets things mostly or completely correct require crawling through old forum posts. Now, I might get something wrong, but as far as I can tell, this is as close to accurate as you're going to get, particularly for instructions in video form. I've compiled all that I've learned from these forum posts, as well as various other videos, and combined them into this, as well as a few things not to do. So finally, finally, after all this research and hassle, sometimes not even finding answers and just having to trial and error things, I'm passing on all this knowledge to you, the viewer, so that no one else has to suffer why you should transfer your VHS tapes. If you haven't transferred your VHS tapes already, you should be doing so right now. Or if you have, you still might want to redo some of the tapes after having watched this guide. To begin with, VHS tapes have an average quality lifespan of about 20 years. Now, don't get me wrong, this doesn't mean that the moment your VHS tape is a day above 20 that suddenly it'll no longer work. However, your tapes are ultimately rotting away. And 20 years ago would have been, oh yeah, that's right, 2003. So if you have tapes, whether they be pre-recorded, off-air, or family memories, they're deteriorating. Sure, most anything from the mid-late 90s should still play okay enough, but some won't. And as time goes on, the quality will get worse and worse. Once you start hitting the 40 year mark, there's no guarantee it will play well, if at all. All of this also depends on how the tapes have been stored all this time. Some of you may have stored things really well, others of you may have stored things rather poorly. So yeah, let's get started with this process before your tapes degrade any more than they already have. Now this will not come cheap. You'll likely have to spend at least $500 on this project, but I also believe it's better to do all this once at good quality than several times at a lower quality. The materials you will need are the VHS tapes you intend to transfer, duh, a computer, a large enough and fast enough hard drive or SSD, a high quality VCR, and an analog to digital converter device. I'll tell you the one I use in a minute. For a VCR, I've gone with the Mitsubishi HS-HD2000U DVHS unit. I'll have a link to a list of VCRs you should pick from. I'd go with the DVHS unit simply because they're newer than the SVHS ones and are less likely to have serious wear. But get any VCR with some sort of line TBC function. Trust me, you'll be needing that. Speaking of TBC, it's been said many times that you'll also want a full frame TBC, which is a good idea, except for the fact that they're really expensive like thousands of dollars expensive. So yeah, sorry, we'll be skipping that. Well, sort of. I've gotten myself a Videonics MX-1, which has a built-in TBC. It was also a little over a hundred dollars, not thousands. Although here's one thing I should say. If most of your VHS tapes have been stored properly and or were recorded in SP mode, you likely won't need this. But if your tapes weren't stored well, were played over and over, were recorded in LP or EP modes, etc., then you're probably going to want this. Trust me, I thought I could go without, and yeah, it didn't go well. While digital is great for preserving things, it is also much more finicky about things being just right. Next, let's briefly discuss the analog to digital converter I chose. I would highly suggest this capture card, the IO Data GV USB 2, which is recommended as a good, relatively inexpensive option both for those who need to transfer VHS and for those who play on retro consoles a lot and wish to record it. 
Now technically the one that does really into this say is the be all end all would be the ATI 600 USB. However, there's a very good reason why I am not recommending this, because the card only seems to work especially reliably on Windows XP, even all these years later. So if you have an old XP machine lying around, you might be able to use this, but otherwise, yeah, don't risk it. Also, don't just pick up any old cheap easy cap device. Trust me when I say your quality will suffer. And don't use most modern capture cards either, mainly because since these are digital and relying on a fairly clean signal, if there's too much noise in your signal, they have a tendency to just drop the signal entirely, and since they need to resync, the video will have already been back for several seconds by the time it's readjusted, which is annoying at best. Also, make sure your capture card has a chroma subsampling of something like 422. 420 will probably also be acceptable. However, in a lot of the other video tutorials I've seen, I see people running things through an old DV camera, which has a chroma subsampling of 411. While this is perfectly serviceable for capturing video that was recorded on that camera, it isn't so good for pass-through, and suddenly people start wondering why things look a bit washed out or the reds look blown out. That that's why. As a last thing, you'll want to be purchasing these things now. I don't want to rush you, but seriously, prices are going nowhere but up for some of these things, and it would suck if you decide to wait and you end up having to pay 30% more than you otherwise would have if you had just gotten it right away. Finally, you'll need an SSD or hard drive capable of maintaining write speeds high enough for saving all of this footage, as well as of a high enough capacity. This is because capturing these uncompressed, which is what we'll be doing to start with, takes up a lot of space. And that space needs to be written to fast. Now while you could offload the uncompressed videos onto another drive after each one is done, which would help with the capacity issue, you cannot get lazy on the drive speed. Most flash drives, for example, will write things in batches rather than in consistent speeds. While this isn't a problem for many applications, in this case it definitely is. Also, while we're on the topic of the computer, I'd recommend using an old or secondary computer for all of this, including stuff we'll go over later on. Sure, you don't have to, but you might run into slowdown or even a few issues if you decide not to. So now that we've gone over the hardware requirements, let's go over software. You'll need to install either the Lagarith or FFV1 codec, which are lossless video codecs, virtual dub to capture the actual tapes, and hybrid to deinterlace and compress them. More on that in a minute. Lagarith or FFV1 shouldn't be difficult to install. Just install it like you would any other program. Open Virtual Dub. Then go to Capture AVI. After that, prepare your VCR to begin playing. This will mean enabling the TBC on your VCR if it isn't enabled by default. Make sure your full frame TBC solution is enabled as well. I also think I should tell you about the MX1 sources. Note that the setup menus are only accessible through composite mode, so be sure to plug that into the capture card and switch the source in virtual dub while you're looking at the menus. Press setup and make sure that both the audio and video sources are highlighted on the source you're choosing to use. In my case, it is Source 1. For the Videonics MX1 that I'm using, it has two settings. One setting will vary the frame rate slightly in order to prevent having to drop or insert frames. If your capture card can reasonably handle this, I'd say use this method. In order to get to the area with the frame rate locking, go to the Advanced menu by pressing Shift and Setup, then go to the Lock icon. Zero is the default setting and should work just fine. One is the more strict setting which will duplicate or drop frames. I recommend setting zero. Here are my devices as I mentioned. As I mentioned, I'm using the IO Data GV USB 2. Here are my video settings. I used FFV1 as it gets the best lossless results at the smallest size, although you may want to choose Lagarith if you're willing to use a bit more space since FFV1 has issues when it comes to interlace flagging for some reason. I'll discuss that more in a bit. Make sure that the correct chroma subsampling of 422 is being detected, like it is here. If for some reason your capture card doesn't have 422, well that might be okay, but make sure it isn't 411. That is not good chroma subsampling. 
it will make things look washed out. Here are my audio settings. I've left the audio uncompressed here. One thing of note with the capture card I'm recommending to you here, however, is that you also need to plug in the audio into your motherboard. The drivers for this capture card haven't been updated in ages, and guess which OS broke everything? If you guessed Windows 10, you'd be correct! So while the video works fine, the audio doesn't work nearly as well. The solution I've come up with for this is using a stereo RCA to 3.5mm audio cable to run the audio into my computer through the line in jack. Just make sure that this is the line in, as the microphone in ports on computers are usually in mono. Be sure to double check that. In the audio settings on your computer, be sure that everything is set properly, such as adjusting the sample rate to 48kHz in every area where it is available. Trust me, you'll have issues if you don't catch this before capturing. There's a setting for this in Windows, as well as in Virtual Dub, so make sure both of those are the same. Also, be sure to turn down the audio on the line in jack through the settings in the OS, since you will get audio clipping if you don't. I've tested it, and for me, 50% works perfectly fine. Try and pick something that isn't super loud, but also pick something that isn't so quiet that you can barely hear it. And yes, don't worry, the audio sounds fine using this method. Here are my timing settings. The settings I've opted to use will automatically adjust for drops or changes in timings. And here's the stop conditions menu. I find out the runtime of the tape and put that in here in seconds. However, I've noticed that for some reason the time can drift up to around 15 seconds for every hour of tape. I don't know what causes this, or if the times are just calculated differently, but I usually add an extra bit of time just to be on the safe side. 100 seconds should be more than fine for basically every tape out there, and probably even a bit much for most of them. Also, give yourself about 5 seconds worth of lead in, just in case. Now I'll demonstrate the method I mentioned earlier of fast forwarding a tape until the very end of the recorded portion to get the runtime. As we can see, the counter stopped a little short of the 2 hour runtime of a normal tape recorded in SP mode since there was never anything recorded on the last 10 minutes of this tape. So we'll insert that into the stop conditions menu for how long the tape should be, plus however many seconds you want as buffer. And finally, here's how you set the capture file. Note that you need to remember to do this every single time you capture a tape. Do not forget to create a different name for each tape. If you start capturing before you've designated a new file, the program will not warn you or hesitate to overwrite the old file. And then you'll have to redo the entire capture of the other tape. This has sadly happened to me more than once, but hopefully it won't happen to you. Now you can either go to the capture menu and click start capture, or press F5 to begin the capture process. Then play the tape. Also, yes, those sort of waves in the sync error aren't anything to worry about. I don't know what's caused them, perhaps it's the USB port I'm using, but they've never given me trouble since the program adjusts what little timing errors there would be anyway. The capture process will take the entire runtime of the tape. There's no way to speed this up. So if you have a 6 hour long tape, then I'd suggest you find something else to do. This is why I said it would come in handy to use a second computer for this, depending on how much processing power it's using. Compression, deinterlacing, and aspect ratios. Now I don't know about you, but I don't think these videos are very space efficient. They're also interlaced, and depending on which lossless codec you used, won't be flagged as interlaced properly, so your media player won't even know to correct for it by default. I'm looking at you, FFV1. I'm also combining aspect ratio fixes in here because this can all be done at once by one program, which I'll get to in a second. So in my case, the video has been captured in 3x2 for some reason. This makes the image appear a bit stretched, as VHS is normally 4x3. There are a couple ways to fix this, however. We can set the display aspect ratio to 4x3 through FFmpeg, although this basically just sets a flag on the file that tells media players, hey, this is a 4x3 file. Some media players also might just ignore this entirely, and editing software doesn't always play nice with it either. So instead, we're going to go with the method I personally think is best with this section here. 
I'll also be showing you how to crop the image during this step as well. As a final warning, I would advise you to actually keep the original uncompressed video files if space allows it. Should something happen, or a better deinterlacing algorithm or compression algorithm somehow surface in the future, having kept those might help you. Of course, if you don't have the space for it, or what you end up with after all is said and done is good enough to you, then I can't stop you from getting rid of the original uncompressed copies. Now then, you'll need to download a program called Hybrid. Once installed, you'll want to open the program and input the VHS captures. I would start with one, or even a small portion of one, just to test and make sure everything is working okay. For video compression, I highly recommend SVT AV1, which is a new compression codec which can get lots of compression with little to no quality loss. Of course, the downside to this is that due to how new it is, it can't play on a lot of devices. If you don't think that's right for your use case, then I'd recommend X265, also known as HEVC, which is a somewhat older compression codec that will run on many more devices. If you still don't think that's enough backwards compatibility for some reason, since someone needs to run this on a really old computer or something, then you can use X264. Anything before that, I can't really help you with. Next, the container format. I highly recommend .mkv as it will take nearly anything you throw at it, but .mp4 should work relatively fine as well. Though I only really recommend it for if you have a use case for it, such as for use in an edited video. You know, like this one. Now we'll be choosing settings that do not rely on which compression codec you choose. We'll get to codec specific things in just a moment. Go to crop slash resize and look at how your videos were captured. If your capture card captured two small black pillars at the edge of the screen, you'll want to crop 8 pixels off of either side of the image. If your capture card did what mine did, where there was one much larger black pillar at the right edge, you'll want to crop 16 pixels off of that. Then you'll want to set the resolution to 704 by 480. In the PAR menu, be sure to convert the output to PAR 10 over 11. Go to the Filtering tab next. Go to the Deinterlace slash Telecine tab. Make sure the Deinterlace handling is set to QTGMC if it isn't already. Set the preset to Faster, and I would highly recommend enabling Bob Deinterlacing as well. This will double the output frame rate so that it can keep the smoothness that VHS has to it. If you have a codec where interlacing isn't picked up by default, such as FFV1, be sure to manually override that setting. In my case, the correct setting was top field first. If you can't tell, if you export a short clip with the wrong settings, you'll be able to tell since the video will look super choppy. Switch fields and you should be okay after that. Also, some people will swear by the slow preset, but this takes much longer with a hardly noticeable improvement in quality. Now then, time for the settings for each specific compression format. Go to the second tab in the top row of tabs, which should be named after whichever compression codec you're using. For X264, select a bitrate of 7000. Normally I'd recommend a constant rate factor, but I'll admit I haven't experimented much with it for this application. If you want to try it out, I personally use a CRF of 18 for capturing gameplay footage, and that's in HD, so you could probably get away with something like 20 or even 23. Just remember that as you increase the number, the worse the quality will get. For X265, do the same thing, but I'd recommend lowering the bitrate. You can probably get away with 5000 kilobits per second just fine, or a CRF of 23 to 27. Finally, for SVT AV1, I use CRF30 at speed preset 6. This will be quite a bit slower than higher presets, but will get you plenty of compression. And now for audio. Opus at 128 is plenty. Honestly, you could probably get away with even less, but that's just what I use. If for some reason you can't use Opus, then use MP3 at 192. Note, however, that in some circumstances, I've had the program throw an error about the audio, so your mileage may vary. I still don't know why this is, and it seems to be random. And that should be it. Make sure all the videos compress properly, and once that's done, double check the file properties and ensure that everything was done properly. Alright, and if you've done everything correctly, repeat that until all of your VHS tapes are completed. Congratulations! I've saved you a bunch of time scouring the internet for all of these things. Hopefully this has helped you. 
I'm sure this tutorial will be out of date eventually, though even then, I think the vast majority of it will revolve around what compression codecs exist in the future. In which case they just drag and drop that in for the compression section from before. I've also heard that there are new VHS transfer projects in the works, although I wouldn't hold my breath for these, especially when even these come with their own set of asterisks, such as VHS decode sounding like a great idea, until you realize that your tapes have to be in nearly perfect condition, and at this time it only works with certain VCRs anyway. Seriously guys, don't hold your breath for any of these things. Who knows what'll happen with these projects, meanwhile your VHS tapes are still rotting away. So I think this tutorial will remain what I hope to be the ultimate VHS transfer guide. Well, thank y'all for watching, and take care.